Mr. Usher, kindly swear in the witness. I am Muhammad Lamin Kasama. Do swear that. Do swear that. I will speak the truth. I will speak the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you. Uh, you may be seated, please. Uh, uh, good morning, Mr. Gasama. Uh, welcome to the Gambia, and thank you for agreeing to take time off to come and testify before the TRRC. Um, we have already met. Uh, it's no longer necessary to do introductions. So today I propose to discuss a few topics with you. The first would be your biographical information, um, the positions that you held in the military, in particular your role as ADC, uh, the issue of rumors about coup d'etat in the early 1990s and how those issues were handled or dealt with the events preceding the July 22nd, 1994 coup d'etat, and how Saar Dauda, or the then president and his party, left State House uh, to go to the U.S. frigate that was moored at uh, the Banjul Wharfs, the events that took place thereafter, uh, refuge in Senegal, departure to the UK, and uh, finally, uh, some of the information you gathered subsequently regarding what happened in the Gambia. Are you comfortable with that? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, you would agree? <coughs> that that would map out the things that you would want to discuss with the Commission, correct? I, yes, uh, I agree to that. Uh, any subsequent uh, side issues to that as well? Relevant, of course. Uh, <clears throat> we would address those as they come up. Um, at the end of your testimony, uh, the Commission would give you the opportunity to say something uh, about, mainly about institutional reforms and the ideas you have that would help our country move forward and in the right direction. Okay? Yeah. Uh, now, could you tell us your full name, please? Uh, my full name is uh, Mamadou Lamin Kasama. And can you briefly um, provide details of your educational and professional background? I did my uh, uh, primary school, primary education, from, uh, from starting from Dankunku, and then uh, completed at Kauru. Uh, from, from Kauru, that was from 19... Uh, 70 to 77 when I came to Muslim high school. Then I, I did my O levels at uh, Muslim high school in 1982. Uh, from then I proceeded to St. Augustine's High School where I had my sixth form education. What did you do after sixth form? I worked uh, at uh, Treasury as an accounts clerk for one year uh, before leaving to enlist into the army. Okay, just for completeness of your biographical information, uh, let's say you were born on 17 January 1963. 1963 I was born, yes, at Banjo. So, uh, 70, you went to Dankunku Primary School, 
and uh, you proceeded then to Kaur, and in 1977, you went to Muslim High School. Yeah. And 82, uh, you went to St. Augustine's for sixth form. Yeah. You enrolled, and then what did you do? You said you joined Accountant Generals, right? Yes, I was at the Accountant as an accounts clerk at the Accountant Generals Department, yeah. For how long did you work at the Accountant General's Department? That was 84 to 85. And what happened after 85? On the 14th of August, uh, 1985, is when I went to enlist into the Army, the Cambodian National Army then. Prior to enlisting at the National Army, uh, to the Gambian National Army, did you but let me rephrase the question. Why the National Army? Well, before the National Army, I tried the police first, and then uh, I realized that the, the procedure of uh, enlisting, I didn't like the whole idea that uh, if I cannot get into the, on my own merit, I don't have to go through any other person. So on the basis of my qualification alone, uh, I should be able to enlist. So when I found that frustrating, I decided, look, uh, service is service, so I would rather go to the uh, National Army. So where then I was in question as to who, whom I know uh, to get into the Army. Uh, well, it is part of our responsibility to identify some of the institutional failings that uh, created problems in this country. You, you mentioned, uh, albeit rather elliptically, that uh, you had frustrations getting into the police. Uh, you had to go to the army where you did not necessarily have to show who you knew mm -hmm. to become a soldier. Can you kindly tell us the problems that you faced in your efforts or attempts to join the police? Well, I, rem I had a, uh, not my, my guardian's daughter, I used to call Mbinko, used to be working there. You used, could you say the name again? I says, they, call him, they used to call her Mbinko, you know, and Mr. Gassama, speak a little bit slowly. You okay, I don't you know. talk fast. So. My my guardian's daughter, uh, whom uh, was responsible for me at uh, Tobacco Road, and uh, she was a police lady at the time. And then she told me, you know, if you want to get into the police, especially to be an officer cadet, then I would use call an aspirant you know, in the police. So I have to go through her, and she will have to introduce me, you know, to her, to her boss. I think boss was Bolisar then, you know. So I felt uncomfortable with that, you know. We went. I think we had an interview, but then the way I made an assessment, you know, definitely this is not the way to go about the things. It should be mainly based on the, on the merit of my, uh, uh, my qualifications so and my certificates alone. Then I decided, you know, this is not for me. You know. What is your basis for saying or for suggesting that your route to entry was not based solely on your qualifications? Well, she has to introduce me to him. You know, it's not like a process where you have to go and sit down an exam to sit on an exam, and then based on your exam or your where you can be assessed. And they say, okay, you have the right qualifications. You've, you've not only the qualifications, but you have passed the exam. You know, what it can uh, allow you to be enlisted into the police force. So, and I have to wait, you know, response from him uh, before I can proceed further. So while that was happening, I said, no, look, um, I'm not having this. You know, if I have my A-level results and I was already working, you know, I don't believe I should be subjected to uh, going behind somebody and then somebody has to decide and wait at the whims, you know, of their own choosing uh, before I could be selected. So I said, no, let me try the army by myself. So I went directly to the army. And what happened when you went to the army? When I got to the army, I remember Wilson. Uh, Benjamin Wilson then was at the uh, training school at the selection. Jokingly, he when he saw my, what was his rank at the time? He was lieutenant, a lieutenant. And then uh, when he saw my certificate, uh, he was like, "What are you doing here?" You know, jokingly said, "People like you, you are here just to make cool." 
you know, because, uh, like I think it was implying, because you are educated enough uh, not to want to come to the army. So, but that was probably just uh, to pull my legs. So, but then there was no issue down there. I just had to pass the medical, and then I was enlisted without any problems whatsoever. And uh, where did you do your training? We had at uh, Farafeni, I'm mean, sorry, at uh, Yundum Barracks. I had my uh, uh, four months basic infantry, uh, infantry training course down there at, at uh, Yundum Barracks. Which intake? The fourth intake. When did you finish your training? That was uh, four months after. Yeah, was, I started in August, so for this will be four months after August. Yeah. So this should be in December and by, yeah, by or December, January yeah. 1995. Yeah, yeah 1985, 1985, 1985, 1985, 1985, 1985, 1985, 1985, 1985, 1985, 1985, 1985, 1985, 1985, 1985, 1985, 1985, as uh, a recruit. What did you do after that? I was appointed uh, uh, to be a training instructor, so I was working with the BAT team, uh, waiting for the opportunity to go for further training ab abroad. What do you mean by BAT team? Uh, the British Army training team. And uh, did you eventually go for training? Yes, I went to uh, Pakistan. Uh, where I did my officer's uh, basic training course at uh, OTS, officer's training course in Mangla Dam, Pakistan. Do you recall, do you recall when you finished that training? I, I finished uh, the training in uh, 7th of uh, uh, April 1988. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you immediately return to the Gambia? Yes, I, I returned straight to the Gambia. Upon returning, I was promoted to second lieutenant. And uh, where were you posted when you returned? I became a platoon commander uh, briefly for, for about one year. I was with Delta Company serving under La Conte at uh, Farafenya Camp. And then after one year, I was brought back to the training school again. Yes, continue. Uh, that was uh, training school from uh, December 88 to 89. I was at training school as a platoon commander at the same time uh, as a training, training instructor. So I was doing like dual roles. Okay. Yes, continue telling us about your career progression. Yeah, okay. 19, uh, like I said, 1990s when I was, I was promoted to full lieutenant, like two stars from a sub-lieutenant to a full lieutenant. Then uh, in the, on the 17th of July, 1990, is when I was uh, appointed to the ADC, to the president of the, uh, the country, Sadauda. That means aide de camp. You were still a lieutenant at this stage? Yes, I was a full lieutenant at the time of my appointment as ADC. Uh, uh, aide de camp is uh, French terminology. Could yeah. you kindly uh, tell us what it means? Well, it's, it means just a helper, by, if you want to directly translate it, but uh, uh, you are like a personal assistant uh, to, the, to the president. Uh, you help, you are the final port of call if you want to see the president, anybody. You know, from the protocol, you are the, you are the kind of usher who will usher people into the president's office and then take them out if need be, you know, by what you establish to a level of communication between you and the president. And of course, like you carry the briefcase and then uh, you ride with the president in the car, you open the doors for him. There are small protocols that goes around the, uh, the ADC. So it's, there is no set uh, rules or terms of reference how you do your job. So basically you develop you are based on your own personality and your interaction with the uh, men who work around the presidency, you know, you kind of define the job uh, yourself. But basically your role down there is ceremonial. You know, 
ceremonial. Uh, the job of ADC, uh, does, did it n traditionally in Gambia carry term limits or not? Yes, it's a two-year term limit. After every two years, uh, it's been changed. That has been the standard until I came. And then, uh, but somehow the president felt uh, more comfortable working with me, and then uh, he, wants, he wanted to make it permanent until to his retirement. Uh, so you worked with him from 1990 when yes. you were appointed until when? Until 1994, uh, on the day of the coup. Uh, did your rank change at any point in time during this period? Yes, while I was there, because I didn't have the I didn't have the chance to, you know, sat through the courses while you, if you are in barracks, so they thought that based on my performance down there and that recommendation that I should have a permanent role that warranted uh, my promotion to the rank of uh, captain. So uh, my uh, command came from my command, uh, army commander, and they recommended me to the promotion of rank of captain. Uh, kindly uh, make us understand the entourage the, or the security uh, around the president. Uh, who are they and what institutions they reported to? Uh, the, the president will have uh, layers of uh, guards. You know, you have uh, the presence and guard commander which is from the, originally from the Zandam, but later on it became reverted to you known as the Tactical Support Group. They provided the bulk of like uh, the, perim the perimeter of uh, state house security. And then you have plain clothes, which will be the closest, uh, close quarter protection. Uh, this Before you get to the plain clothes, okay. um, you mentioned the TSG the yeah. first layer of protection, yeah. uh, the state guards. Yeah. Who was their commander at the time? At, at the time of the coup, it was uh, Kababajo. But before, I had worked with several of them before. I worked with Murunjai, and I worked with uh, Turo Jaune, and then I worked with Kababajo as well. At the time that Kababajo uh, was uh, state guards commander, who was immediately below him? Lantom Bontamba was the one uh, below, below Kababajo. What were their ranks at the time? A lieutenants. Both of them? Yes. And who would uh, Kababajo report to? He reports to uh, his uh, commander, which would have been uh, uh, Pasal Ajayn. Would he be reporting to Pasal Ajayn directly, or there is another intermediate commander? Not that I know of, because like I say, that's their. Well, it's, it's, he was reporting to Tro Jaune, who would be in charge of uh, the uh, the barracks as the headquarters for the TSG. Yeah, but then Tro is also answerable to Pasala Jain. And you said the next layer was the plain clothes. The plain clothes. Yeah. Could you tell us about them? Uh, this comprise of uh, uh, you will have the uh, from this. In, Intelligence, NSS, then National Security Service, uh, plain clothes, and some from the uh, Zandam as well, or the TSG. And who would they report to? They will report to Kababajo. Including the intelligence? Yes, because they kind of uh, on, uh, you can call it second men, so they'll be, he'll be responsible for all of them. And then the next would be the ADC. Yeah, the, the ADC virtually, is, uh, I said, it's like you are in no man's land, so you don't have uh, any command responsibility. Uh, you don't. Uh, uh, I'm responsible to the. I mean, I mean, I can only, I can report to my army commander, but there, there was no cause to. You know, virtually, when you are down there, you don't have any more contact with anybody. So, so you have to forge a relationship between you and all these units working around with the presidency. Okay. Um, as ADC, you were the last port of call before the president. Yes. Uh, it meant you had to be wherever he was yes. during his official 
uh, duties, correct? Yes. Did you have to travel with him? Uh, yes, I have to travel with him wherever he goes. In 1994, or in the years before 1994, we have evidence that there were lots of rumors of coup d'etat. Yes. Do you know anything about that? Yes. Uh, I remember it was uh, mid the farmer's store. Sorry. Could you on, say again? On the mid the farmer's store, before, uh, be, be, regarding Yajame in particular, because I just want to, because this whole thing surrounded around him. He was then the, at State House, and there was, There was rumors that he was corresponding with uh, Kukwe Sambasanyang, the one who staged the 1981 uh, coup. I think based on those rumors, or whether it was substantial enough, at least it was to them, that he was removed from the State House and sent back to the, uh, the military police unit of uh, the tactical support group. But then still, he was able to join us, you know, when we are going on Midi Farmer store, as uh, his role would be uh, responsible for vehicle movement or parking cars, or something to that effect. So he joined this particular tour, uh, this particular tour we were going around the country. Before we set off, there was rumors that somebody was going to make an attempt on the life of the president, and then that he was a suspect. So my uh, who, attitude who was... Who gave you that information? Well, I, I would get it from normally from... Uh, the, the presence of guard commander, or then we had Daba Marina as well, who was with the uh, the plain clothes, you know. So sometimes I con he confides he co he confides with me about any kind of potential threat uh, information he gets. So that was the situation, and then you know, because like, like I said before that you, you have so many false rumors here and there, you don't take take them seriously. But this one, in particular. Uh, it was uh, hotly uh, rumored. It was taken seriously. Do you recall the the, the, the year of the meet the farmer story you're talking, you're think, talking about? I, I think this was 92. 92, nine, 92. I'm not quite sure, but I think 92. During this, during this time, in which force did Yaya Jamo belong to? He was at the, uh, at the Zandam, or at the TSG headquarters then back. Yeah. He has already been removed from state house. Yeah. Okay, okay, and then, uh, do you know how long after his removal from state house did this event take place? I won't. I won't be able to say. I won't be able to say. It's a long okay. time ago. So, in spite of his removal from state house because of the allegation that he was corresponding with Kukoi, mm -hmm. and then there were suspicions. Uh, that during the meet the farmer store, he was going to make an attempt on the life of the president. It was not, still not decided he was he was a potential suspect. A potential yeah, suspect. Sus suspect. Yes. In spite of all that, it was decided that he went on the tour. Yeah, he went on the tour anyway with his uh, military police unit. Yeah. And then what happened during and, the tour? And then I think while we are at Sapo, of course, I wasn't aware at the time. Uh, I understand this, one of our drivers, a very nice gentleman we used to call Boiba. He is a driver for one of the escort vehicles. And then he, he dropped his pistol, I understand, whether he was trying to draw or whatever, but it dropped on the floor. What do you mean by whether he was trying to draw well, or whatever? As you're supposed to take it out, you know, try to shoot somebody. You know, of course, you, you, your pistol is almost in the hustler. It should be like strapped and locked in there. But somehow, whatever happened, they said he dropped his, this now secondary information to me, that he dropped his uh, pistol on the, on, the, on the floor. And then everybody's focus, you know, changed to him, that he was probably the potential assassin everybody's been talking about. So this went on uh, to Basse. You know, I swear in, people were hotly rumored, but the... For, for me, around the presidency, I never had any news about it, you know, until we went to Sapo still, I didn't hear anything. The only thing I had while we were with the president was 
somebody shot himself. So I came how, and then they started explaining. He came in, washed his car clean, got into the Pajero, and took a gun, and then shot himself. This was a sapo, committed suicide. So when I asked, and I was told that uh, probably he felt pressured, that all eyes were on him, that uh, uh, this rumors was going around, that he is the person who was made, made, going to make an attempt on the life of the president. So uh, people have different levels of uh, stress, and he couldn't handle the stress. So he found it's the only way to end it. So he went on uh, inside the uh, Pajero, locked the door, Apparently, after having breakfast with his commander, Trojaune, didn't say anything. There was no inkling that he was going to do this. So he ended up his life, committed suicide. Uh, what happened after that? Well, uh, that from it became the uh, responsibility of uh, the, their command. They, they handled the rest, so we, we continued on our tour. Yeah. And uh, how about Yaya Jami? Yaya at the... Towards the end of the tour, uh, like I said, when these rumors initially came out, I kept an eye on him, <clears throat> mostly just to observe his movement. Can you explain what you mean by that? I, uh, because I, knowing uh, when I had this information that, of course, he could be a potential suspect for me, I want to see, at a, always be at a vantage point where I can keep an eye on him for, so that he will not notice that I'm observing him. So when we, uh, when we reach at Mansa Konko, uh, he came to me, he said, Kasama, yeah, you are a chameleon. You know, I said, what do you mean? You know, he laughed. You know, and then he went away because he noticed that throughout the entire tour, you know, I had kept my eyes on him. I will leave the, the guardian of the president. It's not my responsibility. You have bodyguards around. I'm down there at ceremony. But I said, okay, I can add uh, to my experience to be able to assess the situation, you know, to, uh, to the level of threat. If he's become a threat, uh, then I can communicate to uh, the, the guard commander. Because for me, my suspicion was not necessarily on Bar, but basically him. So, so I wasn't surprised that he came to me and straight away and told me, uh, you are a chameleon. Uh, probably thinking that, uh, you know, I've been very, uh, how called, disguised in the way I've been uh, observing him. Uh, how about the presidential guard commander, were there ever, were there any suspicions about him? If there was any, it wasn't communicated to me. It wasn't, but I, I passed this, uh, uh, had a discussion uh, with the commander that uh, this would be the last time he should be on the tour. If he is uh, of a level of threat, I can see the rationale, you know, allowing him to be on tour again. Okay, just to kind of part, uh, in a way, so that he wouldn't be suspicious uh, with me. He came to me uh, himself, and then he said uh, he, Tabaski is coming, and he's broke. He wants us to help him with a, with a ram. Then I called uh, Jere Sanyang, who was the head of the household. You know, he's the brother of the late Paramount Chief, Demba Sanyang. So uh, he went to part of the Sadar's garden, uh, where he was giving a ram for his Tabaski. Uh, how about other incidents of, or other rumors of poor clots. Did you have a situation wherein a presidential guard commander was also suspected of wanting to make an attempt on the life of the president? Allegedly, yes. Uh, we were, we left, uh, normally when we are traveling, nobody in our entourage travels with a weapon. Yeah, you're not allowed to travel with what whatsoever because when you go to a country, uh, only in, probably in West Africa will go with a, a weapon, but we hand them over on arrival, but not to Europe or anywhere else abroad. We don't travel with any weapons because your security is within the responsibility of your host country. Until you leave, if you go to another country, they are responsible. So there was absolutely no need for anybody to travel with weapons. But on this particular occasion, I wasn't aware that uh, the presence of guard commander then had weapons on him, tucked in his uh, socks. So who alerted the British, I don't know, but somehow the information got from here. And then they are on arrival at uh, Gatwick Airport, that he was searched, and then they found weapon, a pistol tucked in his, uh, in his socks. 
So he was arrested down there and then detained. Uh, you were uh, always or frequently around Sadauda. Do you know whether he had information about all these rumors of coup? He, he, of course, he had so many of them. But we used to say, you know, if he listens to people, you know, he will go mad. That's, that's what he said, you know, because every now and then somebody will come with a rumors of a coup, you know, it will be some marabou, you know, uh, said this and that. And he would say, look, if I listen to this, you know, you know he, he's somebody he, he believes in faith. He said if it's, about, if it's meant to happen, it will happen. And he would say it happens in Nigeria all the time anyway. You know, so you cannot come and tell him there's rumors of coup unless you bring concrete evidence. You know, he's the type of personality you cannot just, he doesn't engage in frivolous tittle tattle. You have to come, you know, with a cast iron uh, information. If you say X deals with this, you know, I have to bring evidence of, uh, evidence of it to him. Then he will, he will act on those, but not just be, uh, based on somebody uh, having some supernatural powers where he can see the future and say, uh, this is going to happen. No, he will not listen to you. He will just say, if you listen to that, he will go mad. Uh, at this time, in the early 90s, could you tell us more about the security around State House? At the early 90s, well, the security, as I found it, you know, I didn't, it's a guarding duty. You know, um, the, when it became a question of whether it was adequate, you know, that, that, that kind of, that question arose following the first demonstration of soldiers and then uh, how they responded. And then all of a sudden uh, there was this realization that uh, at least they felt at the time that they didn't have enough arms uh, uh, to defend. That's from the guard commander, uh, that's uh, through who, Jaune. Who is there? Through Jaune uh, made that request then to Mawajob that uh, uh, he needed more weapons uh, if, the, if, the, if the, princess, the guards should be able to mount any kind of form of resistance, should there be a problem. Uh, directed towards the state house. But then, during the process also, some guards found their way to me and they said, look, uh, we need extra training, you know, if you can help us, because we are not trained enough uh, to handle if any situation should uh, come our way. Uh, we are not proficient enough to defend uh, this particular, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the state house, because structurally, uh, the state house is not a fort that is meant to stand a skirmish. In peacetime, you know, when you have, a, when you have guards down there, you can, you can uh, normal guard duties, stop ordinary people. But if it's an assault, you know, you won't be able to uh, defend. I think that's what these guards were actually uh, implying. So my suggestion then was, uh, one, uh, twofold, uh, pick up your brightest uh, uh, soldiers, if you can send them on training, and when they come, they can impart those training to the men you have. And as a temporary measure, why not we invite the army in to come and have some defensive structures within the state house, like uh, based on my knowledge from what I got from Pakistan, that you can have bunkers that can even stop a battalion, you know, if you, if you, I mean, if it's properly constructed. So I wanted some uh, three or four of that kind within the state house complex as a line of defense so that we can invite the, uh, uh, the, the army to help in that regard. But then following a National Security uh, Council meeting, uh, this idea was put to the army commander, then the acting army commander, from uh, which was, my job was uh, the acting army commander at the time. So the, the, the National Security Advisor, as he narrated to me, because I was in at the sitting, you know, of course, it's normally service heads that will, that will be at the, that meeting. And they said, uh, why do you want to uh, protect State House? He said, well, uh, uh, this, uh, they found it necessary. And what he was saying that uh, if we want to take State House, we can take State House any time. Who, who said that? He said, my job told him that. He was the our army, acting army commander. So when he called me, he said, had it been in Nigeria, you make such a remark, it's treason and you could even be hung for it. 
because uh, this is your seat of power, or you want to improve the security, why should somebody question, you know, uh, that kind of uh, trying to protect the executive? You know, so I think that led to uh, partly him being removed uh, uh, from his post. Who, be, who being removed from his post? From Mabajo. Were your recommendations acted upon? No, they were not acted upon. They were not acted upon. Do you know whether the security advisor supported your recommendations? He did, and I didn't only stop that actually. And I, I call also the uh, the Pasala Jang. Uh, given that, like I said, my position being uh, uh, I call it no man's land, so I'm trying to do the best I can and it kind of foster kind of cohesion. Uh, within the services to see how best uh, they can both, uh, the two services of the TSG and the Army can come together and then uh, not only protect the, uh, protect the state house but the security of the country. So I made this suggestion to uh, the, uh, the IG. I said, uh, why not, uh, being a small country like us, pool our resources together and have a system whereby we can train both the, the Army and the TSG together like in Farafenge, on completion of their training, and then they can be redeployed back to their units. In this way, there will be no f a sense of insecurity, as it was portrayed to me by, by the guards. Because there was this fear that if should there be any problem, then uh, they don't think they can they have the, uh, uh, the necessary training, like fighting in built-up areas, you know, what we call FIBWA in the Army. You know, I mean, they have to have, you know, pro they have to be proficient in training, exercising enough, to be confident enough to, know, to be able to uh, uh, carry out such an exercise. So they didn't have any such knowledge. You know, for them it's only, they, they are very good in firing, but you know, nobody's bloodproof. You know, uh, you know this whole idea of Jambaria doesn't, uh, as a training instructor, we try to get that out of the army's head. You just apply what you've been taught. So you can see where the, being realistic, the, the, the guards themselves, uh, realize that they are really sought in this particular department. So as a way of uh, allaying that fear, and then I suggested this thing to Pastor Lajan. And he said, well, Kasama, it's a good idea, but I cannot see it happening in the next 10 years. And that was it. That, that was that. Did you make these suggestions to Sardauda? No, I wouldn't make uh, my, unless it's something of, uh, there's something eminent that I know of, uh, Either, either to deal with his own person, or even if maybe politically once or twice, or security-wise, I wouldn't go to Sahadara for that. I'd rather go to the National Security Advisor, or I make a suggestion uh, to the Sec Secretary General. At this time, in the early 90s, 92, 93, 94, there were some changes uh, in the Army in the security forces in general, Zandarmeri and army. Can you tell us about it? I, th I think the, uh, when uh, with the, by the end of the Confederation, you know, the, there was, uh, I want to say it was a British technical advisor who said uh, the, the idea of Zandarm is something that uh, is not in the British culture. So the uh, he recommended amalgamating the uh, uh, the Zandam uh, into the into the police, and then the military wing, uh, the, the military police wing was uh, um, uh, amalgamated to the army. You know, because they thought, uh, you know, it's not a British tradition, and then uh, not that the British haven't tried it. Well, this is my own perspective, you know, before. Uh, they have tried this idea of uh, Zandam, I remember 1917 to 1921 in Lebanon, and they found it very ineffective in terms of crisis. So they, until they had to deploy the black tans from uh, Ireland. So I'm just trying to understand uh, why they say it's not a British tradition. So they would rather you have the, uh, an armed police unit like they have in the UK, and then you have the army, completely different. So they recommended this uh, amalgamation of the, uh, the tactical support group, uh, part, part of them into the army, part of them into the police. Did the British continue to remain with the army in the Gambia? 
I think they were here up to the time I think NATAC uh, came. Uh, that's the Nigerian Army Tactical Assistant Group. Uh, when they came in, and then uh, they found themselves, you know, or whatever the reason, I don't know the reason why uh, they uh, ran up their, uh, their tenure here. And, but I understand the government wanted them to stay. You know, but then they said they, they can't, they can't uh, since uh, that's another force down there, so they left. And uh, the Nigerian contingent, uh, who was their leader? Uh, it was Brigadier General Ibrahim Dada uh, was their leader, uh, personally appointed by uh, uh, General Babangida Tenyo to bring. Uh, he was the one who came as head of the NATAC uh, contingent uh, in the Gambia. Uh, tell us if you know what was the impact of the Nigerian presence in the Gambia. I think their impact was more on the organizational part of the army, restructuring uh, to have a proper headquarters, which we didn't have before. And then, uh, but uh, as to the nitty gritties of what was happening in the camp, because I wasn't at the camp at the time. I was more at State House, even though I had uh, dealings with the uh, General Dada when he was working with the, on the terms and conditions of service, you know, then he would consult me. You know, I would say I've kind of become a, a lobbyist for the army in, in that sense. You know, so if the, uh, I remember until at one time, you know, Secretary General told me you are very biased towards the army. Well, naturally, if you, the army wants something that's good for the army, you know, I, I would stand up for the army while he was. So, so I had a very good relationship with him uh, in that regard while he was trying to uh, uh, bring some favorite, favorable terms and conditions for the soldiers. That must have been something that was beneficial. Uh, but uh, as far as you know, did the presence of the Nigerians uh, have any negative effects on the, in the army? Uh, not, not, not professionally, but what, you, what I tend to get, uh, the vibes I tend to get, is the kind of, uh, if you can call it jealousy. Uh, and I'm so whether to what extent this uh, affected the officers, but uh, the lifestyle, and then the, they, they paid from Nigeria. Average soldier maybe earning thousands of dollars, or who knows, and Dada himself being the paymaster, we will collect their uh, money from Dhaka and come and pay them. Because, so they were well paid and well looked after. So naturally, this will create uh, uh, jealousy uh, within the ranks of the army. But I'm not sure whether this affected uh, their professional relationship you know, uh, what, what they were doing within, in the army then, in terms of their restructuring. And then uh, I wasn't aware of any training, substantive training uh, at that level. At around this time, did, did you at State House, did you realize or did you come to notice any form of dissatisfactions or grievances among the soldiers in the barracks? Not necessarily, but I had a concern, and my, my concern was uh, being from a military uh, a country. I made this suggestion that uh, Nigeria can have a change of government anytime, and that change of government can pull all their troops, and then like the Confederation, how it ended, and then we, a huge vacuum was created. It's about time uh, we select uh, the, or the, Na the Nigerian training team goes into advisory role, you know, and our, our own Gambian uh, uh, commanders take the command role, command position, and then uh, that way, even if anything happens, yeah, at least uh, they are well groomed into, because our army is still fairly young, you know, by any standards, you know, so uh, we should be uh, mindful of that change to happen in Nigeria. So... I think a decision was made, then uh, the problem was uh, who should be appointed uh, to command the army. So they came down to the idea of uh, if they can select uh, the brightest ones, the senior, within the senior cadre of officers we had, and then the brightest of them will be selected. You know, I thought naturally you just go for whoever was the most senior, and it would have been like Chris Davis, or, you know, but then they said no, uh, let's take the 
down the uh, line that's when uh, Lai Conte and then uh, uh, Sheikh Omar Fai uh, were selected to go on course uh, to be one of them or later on Babu Karjata, within the three of them, you know, whoever excels uh, in their uh, field would be uh, nominated to command the, uh, the army. But in the meantime, while these people were being sent for training, who commanded the army? Dada was still in uh, command of the army up to uh, his uh, recall. Uh, I think it was sometime in 1994. Um, I think we were at uh, Mandela's inauguration, I think, when we first got wind of uh, uh, Lawan Guadebe uh, coming to Gambia as the next contingent commander. I think the president was told that. So uh, somehow this person was very concerned about uh, the, uh, the personality that was Lawan Guadebe and that he got uh, a reputation for being involved in virtually every coup in Nigeria and that we should uh, resist his coming at all costs. But then uh, the president was like, you know, this is a friendly gesture from a broader, a broader uh, country you know, he cannot just say uh, no to uh, if they want to change the, the command uh, whose time is due uh, to, to be recalled back, which was General Dada, to be replaced by uh, Lawan, Colonel Lawan Guadebe. So it's your suggestion that Sadawda accepted that change? Is that yes, right? he accepted that change. Did that change actually take effect? Before the change, uh, uh, Dada wasn't happy with that. Uh, he tried to lobby me. He came to me. Of course, I was sympathetic to his views uh, because I don't know what the Memorandum of Understanding stated, but he kept on harping on this idea. Uh, it is unconstitutional, the, the, the manner in which he was recalled back, and that uh, uh, it is a disrespect uh, to the sovereignty of the country and the Gambia. And he added that uh, they messed up Nigeria already. He made this one, I remember, in particular. And now they want to call him back. So he wants no part of it that is going to Nigeria. So in other words, he was uh, either by hook or crook, hell-bent on staying here. He doesn't want to go. You know. Did he accept his replacement? He didn't. He didn't, he didn't uh, uh, accept that uh, uh, request to go back. So he stayed here. And what happened to the position of commander of the army? Then uh, Colonel Akoji uh, was then the acting commander, uh, awaiting the arrival of uh, Colonel Lawan Guadebe. Yeah. Uh, was Akoji formally given the responsibility of commander of the army? Not necessarily, to my knowledge, as far as uh, coming from the presidency, I, I, this would have taken effect naturally from the army ranks. If the commander is not there, the second in command will take over, or the third in command will take over. But in this particular occasion, I think uh, Akoji was the third in command. Onobi was the second in command, I think, but then he was away. So Akoji has to uh, assume command until uh, Lawan Guadebe came. Kindly elucidate more on this issue of, on this particular situation. What, do, what did that situation mean for the command structure of the army? Well, uh, uh, what do you mean exactly for the command structure of the army? Because it's not like it's with commanderless. As far as the, the Gambian side is concerned, we had our most senior officers uh, away on course. And then... Uh, you can say it's a vacuum, but then uh, there, there is not, normally the third in command took over, so you cannot say it's completely commandless. You know, but then the one who is meant to come hasn't taken over. The one who was recalled refused to go back. So we are kind of uh, in that state of limbo. Did that have any negative effect on the army? Well, uh, it, not, it, it will have. It will have effect on the, on the army. That's what it will have. So this situation persisted until 
21st July 1994, correct? Yes. And at this time, where were you? I traveled with the president uh, in 19, uh, before, yeah. I, I traveled with, uh, with the president in 1994, before July. I think it was meant to go to uh, Tunisia. I remember at the particular trip, I must have stayed behind and in London because I got uh, malaria, severe malaria. I think they went without me to uh, Tunisia and they came back because I had a two weeks break. So we had, had a break in London and then before he came back. So I, I came back with him. And while you were in London, did you hear anything about disturbances in the army? I, I remember Kaba Bajo mentioning, uh, like I said, uh, not necessarily that there would be the rumors of uh, soldiers demonstrating. And then the way he put it was, you know, uh, in, in Maninka, you know, indicating that this. Uh, but could you say that a bit slowly? Coming, <laughs> you know, that this unruly. Your disorderly people, they. You know, in other words, he means that these unruly soldiers are about to make a demonstration again, but the situation is under control. Because uh, I could notice uh, the flurry of uh, communication, you know, whispering, you know, uh, between either him, him and probably Lantombo. I don't know he was talking to the other end, but I'll assume it's his uh, second in command, Lantombo. And then uh, on the other side, we had Bakari Dabo, who was the, uh, from the NSS. Uh, who was also uh, communicating uh, probably with Keba Sise, his boss. Okay, let's clarify this. Uh, you, there was a Bakari Dabo at the NSS, National Security Service. Yes, it was. Different uh, from the Bakari Dabo who was then yeah. uh, Minister of Finance. Yeah. Okay, good. So, and uh, what happened that day? This was 20, uh, 20 July or 24th July 1994. Uh, did this information filter to Sardauda as, as far as you know? Uh, at no point was I aware of any briefing uh, uh, given to Sardauda. And then uh, I said that because naturally, by my role, even if we are there on holidays, if they want to see the president, uh, they will let me know. And I'll inform him, you know, that has always been the protocol. I will inform him that uh, uh, the head of the guard wants to talk to you, uh, if it's of the guard and security, you know, I could be present, you know, most of the time I will be. But at this particular, uh, on the 22nd, on the eve, I wasn't aware of any briefing uh, while we are at uh, Hayward's Heath in, in, uh, in London, in the UK. You, you said that the, that Bakari Dabo, the, the NSS, bodyguard who was with you was having conversations with his boss. Who yes. was his boss at this time? His boss was Keba Sise, who was the Director General of the National Security Service. Do you know whether Keba Sise briefed Sardauda while he was in London? No, he hasn't. Uh, can you tell us how the decision was taken uh, for the for the group Sardauda's entourage to return to Gambia. Well, as per protocol, normally the, pro the protocol officer is the one who is responsible for all our itinerary. You know, for for me, all I need to be told is this is the time we're traveling. This is the time we're traveling, and then the uh, the uh, the orderlies will. Uh, and that particular incident was about Bakari Kamara. They'll be responsible for the luggage. So as far as I'm aware, it's just a normal, you know, standard operational procedure. So we just uh, uh, get ready to leave. So tell us, uh, from your part, did you have any suspicion Absolutely that not. anything was going on in Gambia? Absolutely. I had no inkling whatsoever. If I had had any suspicion, my, my own, uh, because I had devised my own uh, SOP. Uh, if I have any uh, inkling coming from the army, I used to call, I would call RSM Jeng at the camp. 
and to get a feedback exactly what is this true or something like that. Then I'll get an assessment. Yeah, but then if it is something like just hot air, you know, I'll just take it as that. You know. Why would you call RSM Jeng? He was not the commander of the army. No, because uh, I know by virtue of his appointment and then uh, by virtue of the responsibility he had, you know, there wouldn't be anything happening within the camp without his knowledge. So I said, uh, uh, and he can always find out if there was something. So he would be the right person to me, not necessarily the commander. You know, and of course I had an interpersonal relationship with him. We both work at the training school together. You know, so and I had that develop. Uh, you won't call it first, but it was very professional relationship we had. You know, so I could trust his judgment. Uh, if there's something going amiss, and then he would definitely pass it on to me. So I didn't find any cause whatsoever to call anybody, because I wasn't uh, the least aware of whatever was happening back home. On the part of Sadauda, did you see anything that would suggest to you? that he may have received some information about what was happening in the Gambia at the time? Absolutely not. So is it your view that you came back to Gambia blindly, not knowing what was going on at all? Completely blind, completely blind. So kindly tell us what happened when you arrived in Gambia. On the 22nd, uh, when, we came, when we came, you know, to me it's a normal routine. Like I said, in the aircraft, I would sit behind the president. Whenever I so going to the toilet, I would escort him, coming back, sit down, just make sure he goes smoothly to and fro. So, of course, this time, the president travel commercial. Uh, yeah, even the commercial, I do that. You know, in every, uh, he always travel commercial. And then uh, I will always be uh, there in uniform so I can be recognized in case he's going to visit the, uh, uh, the bathroom. So I will escort him. And then, uh, yeah, he's easily recognizable there. So he's always, he's always traveled commercial, by the way. Yeah. So, yeah, so we arrived at, uh, and, and normally the protocol is when you arrive, the Plain clothes security will go out, secure the area, and then the deputy, the deputy chief of protocol will come and invite the president to come down, meeting the chief of protocol, you know, say, is the president ready? You know, I'll make sure when he's ready, and then he's ready, then, yeah, so they will lead the way, and I'll follow behind. So we come down the foot of the plane. So yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, we come down on the foot of the plane, and then you have the, uh, uh, the receiving party, you know, they'll line up and then we'll shake hands before we go to the dais to take the national salute. And then uh, from there on, we did a guard inspection where he'll go outside and inside the ranks of the soldiers and then come back, take the salute, and that's it. Uh, we head towards the cars. I wasn't aware of absolutely, I didn't see anything. And uh, only, the only thing there were fewer people normally uh, than uh, sometimes, you saw normally you have a can have a big entourage, I mean, of people coming to receive the president. But beyond that, you know, I have absolutely no inkling of uh, anything amiss or whatsoever. It's, it's a normal thing to me, the way I see it. You know, my eyes were fixated on the president, that's all. But, yes, everything appeared normal. Normal to me, yeah. But did you subsequently realize that there were some anomalies? Well, I know the vice president wasn't there. Uh, he was there to normally, and he's in the country. He should be the person to receive the president. Uh, if he is out of the country, then the next uh, senior in terms of uh, ministerial responsibilities, uh, being the, uh, the minister of justice, I would, I would uh, assume that responsibility and then receive uh, the president. Like in this particular case, uh, Asan Jalo was there uh, who received him. So the vice president wasn't there. I have no idea where he was, you know, whether he was out of the country or in the country. I actually have no idea at that time, you know, that where he was in the country. And uh, from the airport, where did you go next? From the airport, normally we'll head back to State House. And then the protocol will, had always been an arrival at State House. Uh, the president will go to his drawing room, and then the vice president, who should be uh, there to brief him, 
about what transpired in the country, virtually handing over co command control, what has uh, happened in his absence, you know, provide a briefing note. So this may take about half an hour to one hour while over they're having a tea, and then uh, before he retires. On this particular occasion, uh, when we got to the drawing room, and he paused, and then we're looking back to receive Asan Yalo. So well, he said, where is Asan? I said, I don't know. He's not coming. So I just went down. So yes, I, I inquired. But they, some said, at the time, they said he branched off around uh, Westfield. You know, well, I came over. Well, I said, well, I came and report to him exactly what happened. Uh, he didn't come with us. So he branched off from West, Westfield Johnson. Some said sitting corner. So, so I told the president. He just shrugged his shoulders and he went in. He didn't say anything? Yes. No, he didn't say anything. So uh, you can only, I don't want to guess, you know, maybe he didn't know his role, that, that particular role, whether he's been briefed properly. That's what's supposed to happen. I don't know. So, and did you remain at State House for the rest of that evening? Until everybody clears, you know, so I headed back uh, to my residence, which was at, uh, next to Radio Gambia, mile 7. And while at mile seven, did you have occasion to talk to anybody? I had, uh, I think Turo, Turo uh, spoke to me, Turo Jaune, and then he told me about this uh, supposed demonstration still that uh, they suspected uh, uh, Ya Jame to be involved. And then he said uh, he put his mind... In, to be involved in what? Uh, to, be in, to be leading this uh, particular demonstration in, at the airport. You know, of course, uh, that's how it was put to me from uh, London. So I assume it's still the same demonstration and he's talking about. So he told me that, uh, and he put his man, uh, that is uh, Alaji Martin, uh, to mark him that if he's up to anything, he will be dealt with summarily. Uh, that was... Uh, uh, what rank was Alaji Martin at the time? I think almost I've been sergeant. I'm not very sure, but most of the sergeant. So it is your testimony that that night Turo Jaune told you that there was going to be a demonstration yeah. led by Yaya Jame at the airport and he as head of state guards. No, not head of head state guards. He was TSG, the head of the TSG. Put his own man, being Sergeant Alaji Martin, yeah. to mark Yaya Jame. Yeah. Just in case Yaya Jame did anything, he would be dealt with summarily. That's what he told you. Yeah. Did you ask him any questions about that event? I, I, I didn't. Uh, so I just assumed you know, that, was the end of, that was the end of it. You know? So yeah, we just came from a, a long trip, so I just wanted to uh, retire. You know? so, and I said, it basically explained to me that was it. So I didn't have any inkling, you know, all that has transpired with, uh, down there or whatever else which I came later to know about. Uh, Mr. Chair, it's 10 minutes to the break. Uh, I think that, that for now, for the commissioners to ask questions, if they have any. Thank you very much, Chairman Council. Um, I think we probably should just take the 30-minute break and uh, uh, come back, and if you have any questions, we'll wait for the end of the testimony. Yeah. And see if we can In do that, that case, I can just continue and take the 10 minutes. Oh, fine. If you want to use of the 10 minutes, I'm going to go ahead and go, please go ahead. Okay. All Thank right. You. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. So that night, you went to bed thinking that everything was okay, correct? Yes, I had uh, already uh, planning ahead on the 22nd because on the 22nd we were meant to have uh, uh, received the Chinese ambassador who was meant to present his letters of credence. He's a new ambassador. So that's the only program I had that I was looking forward to. You know, so apart from that, I have no uh, suspicion or whatever had happened in the country. No, I have no idea. And uh, what happened the next day? Uh, the next day in the morning, naturally, I, I got dressed in my ceremonial uniform, you know, because I'm going to have a guard of honor. So when I came to State House, uh, went to 
I, I walked through State House, nothing abnormal. You know, you have the two sentries, you know, at uh, uh, the gate. At the gate, I normally entered through was from the uh, hospital end. You know, so from there, of course, you come naturally first to the guard commander's uh, uh, office, which is just at the down, downstairs below the main state house building. So uh, that's why I walked through, and I found uh, Kababajo. They are standing with uh, Keba Sise. What position did Kababajo hold at this time? He was the, uh, the uh, commander of the pres presidential guards. What was his rank at the time? Uh, he was lieutenant. And uh, you said the other person was K. Basise, correct? K. Basise, yes. What position did he hold at this time? He was the Director General of the National Security Service, the NSS. And what happened there? Uh, then it was uh, Kaba informed me that there have been some shootings at uh, Yundum Barracks. Uh, what time of the day was this? This must be around 8 o'clock because uh, the President will normally go uh, between 7 to 8, normally 8 o'clock after be there, ready to take him to. Uh, to the office, so it will be around that eight o'clock time. Okay, and uh, yes, you were told uh, yeah, there the, were disturbances at yeah, the Union Barracks. At the Union Barracks, I think I did attempt to call Union Barracks from there, but the phone was just ringing endlessly. No one was picking up the phone. And then uh, Keb and Kaba told me that Keba Sise, uh, he wanted to go and uh, brief the president about rumors of a coup. He had a, a folder in his hand. You know. Do you know whether, whether he did that? To my knowledge, uh, I wasn't aware when he was uh, when he went to. Uh, I wasn't present when he went to because he went by himself. I didn't escort him because uh, my my first reaction was when he told me that. I was saying rumors of court. I mean, they're firing. That's, it's, it's a bit late, if anything, to go and uh, uh, brief the president. But I, I didn't ask. I asked uh, Kaba what was, uh, where is the vice president? He said the vice president is in his office receiving guests from the uh, U.S. Lamour County Frigate. Well, that, again, was like a news to me. But then... Uh, 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 what was news to you? The fact that uh, there is uh, uh, a frigate here in the country, uh, uh, I didn't even know they were even for exercise. I didn't, at this point, I just know that he has uh, the president, had, the vice president has guests in his office. So he's the minister of defense at the same time. So a problem of this nature, I had to go to him first if he's there and then talk to him. Because he's the boss of my, uh, my, my boss, if you can call it. I mean, the army commander. So, naturally, I went to his office straight away. Tell us what happened there. Uh, when I walked in and I said, uh, uh, I didn't even sit down. I just went straight to him. I could see everybody sitting around you know, in their uniforms. And I said, uh, Who did you see? Uh, the vice president was there. Ambassador Winters was there. Andrew Winters. Plus the, from, uh, from which country? Uh, Andrew Winters was the ambassador of the uh, United States. Uh, yeah, he was there present, plus the command of the uh, the frigate. They were, it was jam-packed. Uh, you can see everybody sitting down there. W which frigate are we talking about and from which country? This is U.S. Lamour County. You know, I'm not sure exactly which country. I can't remember which country it was. From America, of course, but which state, I'm not sure. It was from America. And uh, they were in a meeting with uh, the vice president at the time? Yes, they were apparently talking about the same issue. So when I, when I came in, I said, well, I had this happen in the camp. Well, he uh, said, Tell us exactly what you told him and that, how he responded. Yeah, I told him, uh, I, understand that I was told that there are some shootings in the camp. He said, yes, we are aware, we are monitoring the situation. Yeah. Did he say anything else? No, I, I, I said, I remember the time, I said, okay, uh, if, should it be necessary? At that, that point, I made that uh, initial suggestion. I said, should it be necessary to have the president on board there in, in case there is a need for it? I, I said that to, to when there are persons down there, when everybody was sitting down there. Well, he said they are monitoring the situation. Then I left there and I came down. And when I came down, I met uh, Samsudin Sa. He was the staff officer. 
uh, our military staff officer at our uh, uh, the defense. What so, was his rank? Uh, he was captain, Captain Samsudin Sar. So I told him uh, the, the state house as it is now, most they are preparing for a guard of honor. So there are virtually no guards here. It's quite, quite almost empty. If you can go to the marine unit and then uh, bring us some soldiers to help bolster the security here while we try and assess the situation. I, I had a discussion with him, and he told me, uh, yeah, uh, they had about 15 millimeter caliber guns, you know, and then uh, he was really uh, adapter, you know, that uh, this thing is happening. Uh, I'll go and bring them, you know, using military explicit terms, you know, come and kick, kick this, uh, let's say, the backside of the soldiers or whatever they are up to. But then, uh, so he was meant to go to the marine unit. As far as the agreement I had with him, you know, to go and bring me more soldiers and then to come and help secure the state house. You said you told him that state house was virtually empty. Yes. There were no security. Yes. Well, no, no, there are no, no security. They were, they are, I assume at that time that they had gone to prepare for the guard of honor, which was meant to take place that, that, uh, that uh, uh, particular, uh, particular day. The Chinese ambassador was meant to come. Uh, naturally, they should have been forming up when I get that early enough. They should have been there. There was no formation, no, nothing there. So I didn't know exactly what had happened in their arrangements. So uh, that's why I told Sam, you know, I need, uh, as a temporary measure, if you can go to uh, the Marine Unit and bring us more soldiers and to come and help uh, secure the State House. Last question before the break. Was the security arrangement at that time normal, as far as you know? As, uh, as far as, the, you'll have the normal centers will be there. Yeah, no, the only abnormality down there was I saw uh, Kausu Kamala, we used to be commonly called as Bombardier, you know, had a, a bandolier of uh, uh, rounds, you know, wrap around him like Rambo, you know, so uh, that, that kind of even brought a chuckle to me. I would say one bullet, you know, you'll just be like a, a, a working time bomb. But then, uh, yeah, I, I wasn't impressed, to be quite honest with you, so uh, that's one of the reasons why I wanted uh, uh, the uh, marine unit to come, you know, uh, soldiers I could actually command. In spite of the, in spite of uh, the fact that you were not impressed by his posture? Not necessarily only him. You know, uh, I'd, and when this thing happened, you know, from the time I communicated, that's I communicated with Kaba, and then uh, I finished there, that was it. I said, I have to be in charge. I have to find a way of either securing the state house or securing the president. That become my, I went into kind of military mode, you know, command mode, if you can call it that. So to find some kind of solution, you know. You said you were not impressed by Bombardier's bravado as, yes. and his yes. posture. Uh, was it wasn't it shocking that the state house was virtually devoid of security? Yes, uh, absolutely. It was eerily quiet, very, very, very quiet. You know, uh, very, very quiet. To be quite honest. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think we leave it at that, and we come back after the break. Thank you very much, Council, and thank you very much, Mr. Kasama. Uh, we will take a 30-minute break and come back at uh, 12 noon. Meeting is adjourned.